say welcome to everyone for coming, um, as well as our online audience, wherever you may be. Um, I'm sure the majority of people here are quite scared of snakes, and some of you might actually quite detest them as we find out. Um, but hopefully by the end of the today, and a little bit more of an understanding, we can learn to coexist with them and hopefully appreciate them by the end of today. Um, just quickly, within regards to talk, I'll cover a multitude of different uh, topics from Biogen, which is now East African Venom Supplies itself, um, onto uh, the snakes of Naivasha, some snake bite first aid. So what I would say is if anyone has any questions about a current slide, by all means, stick your hand up and we'll get to it. Otherwise, if you have any general questions, we can wait till the end. There'll also be a live demonstration with a puff adder at the end, but I'll try and keep it to this end of the room so we don't have anyone, any casualties. Great, starting here. This is the normal photo I get. If I post this, this is what I get a response from my mum quite quickly, catching cobras with flip-flops. <laughs> normally works quite well. Great. All right, so just about East African Venom Suppliers, like I said, formerly known as Bioken. Um, it was set up by James and Sandra Ash over 41 years ago. The main reason it's in Watamu was at the time, Khalifi County was at the epicenter of Kenya snake bite. That's no longer the case. It's now, Baringo is where we deal with most of our serious snake bites. Um, like we said, it was then left to Royan and Claire um, who made it is what it is today. And fortunately before Royan passed a lot of, he got a lot of things through for us and you can see the developments going on at the farm. So what you can see is the original Bioken team um, from top left, Wycliffe, who now resides in Western Kenya, Sander, who passed away unfortunately a few years ago, same Royan, then Boniface, who is the snake farm manager. So if you ever go down to the farm in Watamu, you'll see him walking around. Um, James sitting in the middle, um, and then Fran Francis Katana on, on the bottom right, who is a famous snake handler. And if you look in the old books, you'll see photos of him free handling some boomslangs and other interesting things. Yeah. So Roy and Claire. So Claire still deals with most of our medical side of Biochem and East African snakes. So any bites and stuff, that's where all the calls go to. So what Royan started was um, what we call the James Ash Anti-Venom Trust, which the idea was to raise money to educate Kenya's health workers at combating snake bite, and as well raising funds to buy anti-venom for more impoverished people around the country. When Royan passed away in 2019, we changed it to the Taylor Ash Anti-Venom Fund, but that still operates today. Um, on to milking snakes, the main thing when we call ourselves Biochem Snake Farm or Watamu Snake Farm is we're still the only farm that actually farms venom. So when we say we're milking snakes, obviously we're not doing it for a bit of maziwa in the morning. Um, we're milking them for the, for the venom itself. But what at the bottom you'll see, we don't actually produce anti-venom ourselves, which has been a myth for quite a long time. A lot of people thought that we were actually producing the anti-venom. We're exporting it for medical research and then vaccine producers will make it elsewhere. Some of that antivenom comes back to Kenya, but some of it will get transported around Africa, mainly. So just quickly, when we're milking snakes, the whole idea of it is you're getting a beaker, or in this case, a funnel with a plastic film called parafilm over the top. And what the snakes are doing is biting into that and injecting their venom which will then seep down the funnel and be collected in the bottom. What we then do is freeze dry this and purify it. And then that gets exported. Because it's a protein, it can't stay as a liquid form or it will expire. That gets sent around to wherever it is. A lot of our research gets done all over Europe at the moment. And then the production of antivenom, um, how it works is what we do is we collect all these different venoms and by studying different toxicities which each venom have, we'll produce a cocktail of, of venoms, which will let, then get introduced to a large bodied animal like a horse and that will produce antibodies fighting those venoms. And normally over about an 18 month period, 
we would have built up those quantities of venom that you're injecting to larger and larger doses. Um, and once we've got to the right dosage, what, what we then do is um, extract the blood from the horse, purify it through a centrifuge. Um, and then from that, we get the serum, the anti-venom serum. So that's why some people do have slight allergies to venom because it's still a foreign body being introduced to your body. Um, obviously the other work we do is snake talks, as you know, as you're partaking in one. Um, but a lot of our education goes into like the more northern and remote parts of Kenya. Educating, educating people on how to mitigate snake bites. And often it's simple things like walking at night with closed toed shoes and a torch, which a lot of people in Bringa County don't do, and they end up being bitten by carpet vipers. And then, like we said, educating the health, uh, health workers. So every two years, what we had been doing, but obviously COVID threw a spanner in the works, was uh, what we call the snake bite seminar, where we get all the leading experts from around the world, from production of antivenom to snake conservation, and we try and educate all our health workers around Kenya and try and tackle issues on how to distribute antivenom correctly around the country to deal with the pandemic. So do we actually need snakes? If you were asking me, I would say their beauty is enough alone, but unfortunately most people don't agree with me. But um, yes, so just from a start, from venomous snake point of view, there's already a lot of medical research that goes into it. And some medicines are actually already being um, produced by certain vaccine producers. So for example, pit vipers in South America are already being, their venom is already being used to treat heart disease. Um, some painkillers from other species of elapids, which are neurotoxic snakes. And we're finding more and more. So if you look at the statistics where we've still got almost half of the amount of snakes on the planet, the venomous snakes, venoms to study. So there's there any potential from the treatment of cancer to all kinds of things. Alzheimer's has been spoken about. And then I always like to say, you, you can never guarantee you've killed all the snakes either as well. So if we went with the mentality that we're just gonna eradicate all the snakes in this area, there's no way to guarantee that you got every single one, but we need snakes to produce antivenom. So if people aren't being bitten and we don't have the snakes to produce it, when someone does get bitten, goodbye. You're not really gonna, there's not gonna be too much more of a look in than that. Um, going on, this would be the main reason. So snakes primary source of food, would be rodents, um, mice and rats. To give you an idea of numbers, if two female or two mice can have 60 young in a year, 30 to 21 of those will be females and will have the ability to breed within a month. So theoretically from two mice, you could end up with 5,082 within a year. The question would then come, what about birds of prey, what about small mammals and other animals that eat rodents but don't pose such a threat to human life? Simply put, small mammals and birds eat at a very constant rate. They don't have the ability to increase their daily intake of, of food, being a warm-blooded animal. So if a mongoose ate two to three mice a day, if that rodent population was to spike, they don't have the ability to suddenly eat 10 rodents that day and then the next day, two rodents, they'll still have to stay consistent. Whereas snakes can go from eating next to nothing to all of a sudden during a spike, eating 10 rodents in one shot, and another two weeks, another 10 rodents, then the month after that, decide they're gonna estivate and go two, three months without a single meal. So in that way, they've got an ability to control rodent populations in a way that other animals simply can't. Um, also, snakes provide a huge source of food for a large amount of animals. So in places in the Kalahari, um, they've registered honey badgers eating up to 80% of their diet being snakes. So they play their part in, in an ecosystem, as, as everything does. I think generally a lot of us already know what to do when you see a snake. And the answer is not pick up a stick and smack it on the head. Um, rather... Just snakes are very defensive animals rather than aggressive. And if you're ever on a walk or anything and you do see a cobra or something, given its space, it will go off. 
Sometimes they might give a little bit of a show and stand up and it can be a little bit intimidating, but generally given, giving them their space, they'll carry on on their way. It's always, as well, if, if you were to encounter one which you wanted removed, it's just a good idea. Once you're at a safe distance, try and get a photo of it. You can WhatsApp that to me or Benji or some of the other contacts that I'll list below. Um, and we can arrange what to do. If it's non-venomous, the likelihood is I'm gonna tell you to leave it alone, maybe if you don't mind keeping it in the garden, obviously it's, if it's not a dangerous snake, it's doing nothing but a favor to you for eating rodents and, and other things. Like we said, don't try and catch it to get a better photo. We, I get sent some scary photos of people holding snakes saying, what's this? And it's a cobra or something like that. So we try, try not to advise people to pick anything up. Um, obviously, call an adult if you if you need help. But otherwise, yeah, like I said, best best call about would be call myself or Benji, whose numbers, like I said, will be listed below. Um, I know this one of these pictures got posted shortly after the puff adder incident. Um, this poster is designed for North America, and the idea is any snake with a triangular head. An elliptical pupil is venomous, and anything with a long, longer head, more narrow, and a round pupil is not venomous. I would say that snake's got a round pupil and a long head, but that's a black mamba. <laughs> <laughs> so this poster, it does work very well for America, where most of the venomous snakes are rattlesnakes or vipers, but in East Africa, are probably top three most venomous snakes, all are lapids. All of them have round pupils and all of them have quite long, longish heads, not triangular shaped. So don't go by that one or you'll get a nasty surprise. Um, just touching on poisons versus venoms, it always irritates snake handlers and herpetologists where you hear people saying, that we've got a poisonous snake in the house. Generally speaking, poison is ingested and venom is injected into the blood system. So in Kenya, we don't have any poisonous snakes, but we've got venomous snakes. And even if you got snake venom within your mouth, you would be fine. It wouldn't do anything. So spitting cobra venom in the, in the mouth just doesn't taste very nice. All right, so we'll, what I've done with the snake identification, I don't want to name every single snake that you find in Naivasha, or we'll be here for an extra hour and a half, and I think all of you will, will be relatively bored by then. Rather, what I've done is I've listed the six dangerous snakes that we get here, or six venomous and an extra dangerous one, and then just the, a few common non-venomous snakes, which you do find, find around relatively common. And I've taken those from photos that everyone around Naivasha has sent me. What's that one? So this is a black neck spitting cobra. Yeah. So not one of the friendly ones. Yeah. Yeah. So the first one, which is probably the most medically significant snake that you get in Naivasha, would be the Egyptian cobra. Um, especially this North Lake side of the lake, you tend to see quite a few. Um, and I've seen a few photos of them up in Green Park. But generally, we're, speak we're speaking about a snake that gets kind of like, you'll see it says 2.5 meters, sometimes a little bit bigger. And the hatchlings will be normally 25 to 30 centimeters and laying about 23 eggs up to like we said, these are averages, so it might be a little bit more, a little bit less. But this is a highly neurotoxic snake, highly venomous neurotoxic snake. Um, so the neuro when I speak about neurotoxins, that's attacking your neurological system, and it shuts down brain signals to the rest of your body. So the way it works is eventually it shuts down the brain signals telling your diaphragm to work, so you end up dying from asphyxiation, and it's fast acting. So this is a snake that you would need to get to hospital relatively quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Egyptian might not have been the best, best name, seeing as you find them all the way down into Tanzania from Egypt. Um, this is just a baby. Um, babies, generally speaking, are a much grayer color. They've still got the cream underneath and a little black band, but they kind of get more mottled, like, like yeah, the bigger one as they get older. So slowly by slowly, they change. The next one, the next cobra you find here, but less likely up at this altitude, you tend to find them down towards the lake, is uh, black neck spitting cobras. I always like to say, 
when people describe snakes, you need to describe it well, because the amount of snake calls I go to, and on the phone call I get described, Ninyoka, Moko Nyausi, Noko Kubosana. And I get there, and it's two foot long, and it's green. <laughs> so I quite like it when someone says, like, this is a black snake. So when it's black and it's big, <laughs> I've got a good idea. But yeah, every snake in Kenya tends to be big and black. Um, yeah, so generally speaking, a little bit smaller than Egyptian cobras, but the Naivasha ones do sometimes get towards eight foot long. Um, similar young, so young, similar size, you're saying 33 to 36 centimeters and lays five to 20 eggs. And this is the time of year, kind of April to now is when the eggs start hatching. So if you see any little ones, this is, we had a little Egyptian cobra caught just on um, Ruby Farm about, it must have been about a week ago. Um, so their venom is different to Egyptian cobras in that they're primarily cytotoxic, which is a cell destroying venom. And this will, the venoms come into play when we talk about a first aid. But yeah, mainly cytotoxic. And the main idea for spitting cobras being cytotoxic is when the venom goes on your eyes, because your eyes are live cells, it dissolves the surface of the cornea. Um, I will explain the first aid on how to treat that in a few slides time. And the little ones tend not to be as black, uh, more a silvery gunmetal gray color, um, but the pink neck is very typical of black neck spitting cobras. So a pink salmony kind of neck color. The, I'm pretty sure most of you, this is probably Kenya's most hated snake. Everyone doesn't like the fact that they're slow and sluggish and quite happy to sit there and wait for you to stand on them. Uh, Naivasha ones are, generally speaking, up to 1.2 meters. Elsewhere in Kenya, they'll get closer towards two meters. Um, hatchlings, so the, when I say hatchlings, pop out as a live bearing snakes. So they don't lay eggs and leave them. They give birth to eggs in an egg membrane and they hatch immediately and, and are precocial from there. They'll just cruise off, no parental care. And the young for a normal live ash one would be 10 to 35, but one that Steve Spalls caught in the Lol Digers gave birth to 156 young in one shot. That's the world record out of any live, out of any vertebrate on the planet. Again, we talk about highly venomous, back to cytotoxin, Obviously they don't spit their venom, but a puff adder bite results in a lot of swelling, a lot of pain, some necrosis, um, but similar to the, to the uh, black neck spitting cobra, it's mainly cytotoxic venom. Easiest thing with identifying them is the V or U mark shapings on the back, which we call chevrons and this very rough scale. The thing with a lot of snakes is they're quite dimorphic in their color. So the Gilgil Naivasha puff adders could be yellow, gray, this one, the photo doesn't quite give it justice, but it's yellow, brown, orange. It's got all these different, different colors popping up all over it. But that big fat body, rough scales, chevrons on the back. Okay, everyone still with me? Yeah. Oh God, I knew someone was gonna ask that. Had to be you. It's like a low hiss. So be like a... I don't know if the one I brought today will do it because it's likes to think it's a house snake at times. Um, so this is a really cool snake that we find in Naivasha, the Kenya horn viper, completely endemic to Kenya. Their range kind of runs from Suswa to Eldoret, but more so Naivasha Gilgil areas where you tend to find them. Um, they get confused with puff adders a little bit, but you can imagine a snake with a range like that's gonna be pretty threatened anyway. So when if anyone sends me a photo of one of these with its head detached, I'm not gonna be very happy. Um, really, they're a much smaller snake. So 20 to 50 centimeters. I've never seen one over even close to 50. Normally you're talking 35, 40 centimeters would be a really big one. Um, same as um, puff adders where they give live birth, much smaller numbers, seven to 12. And then hatchlings are only about 10 to 15 or 10 to 12 centimeters. You'd have seen from medical significance, I've written venomous, but no known fatalities. It doesn't mean if you got bitten, sit at home and take a painkiller, maybe still take yourself to hospital just in case, but we haven't had any fatalities. And being such a small snake with a similar venom to puff adders, being cytotoxic, we don't consider them to be life-threatening. 
it would hurt thee. It would hurt. Obviously, identifying them, you've got these little horns, um, and then a nice golden line that runs down the body with the darker spots. But they can change a little bit in color depending on if they're shedding in a couple of other variants. And the They'll hiss, hiss as well, like puff adders. So they do sit in the grass, and if you get too close, they'll hiss, but it's not quite as impressive as a puff adder hiss. A little bit quieter. Um, so the next one would be boom slang. And now we're going on to a whole different other kind of venom now, which is called a hemotoxin. So hemotoxins prevent your blood from clotting. So most of the damage gets done internally, um, and it's it's not a kind of snake bite that you would realize you're in trouble for a while. And usually deaths happen after 12 hours, but the symptoms would be bleeding from most orifices. So eyes, nose, gums, you'll have it in your urine. And that's the first sign that you're, you're in pretty big trouble. Um, normally we're saying 1.2 to two meters. I wouldn't say they get, the Naivash ones get too much bigger than that. They lay eggs, so similar to a cobra, and will leave them. And those normally eight to 25 eggs. The good thing about bum slangs is their behavior typically is they're pretty shy and they're arboreal. So they spend most of their time in the trees. So you don't end up having conflict with them too often. The problem with them when it comes to identifying them is they come in a horrific amount of different colors. So I've done three colors, color morphs, which are most common in Naivasha. But don't phone me when you find a black one or a golden one saying you didn't tell us, because they do come in so many different colors. The main identifying feature would be the eye, just being a much bigger eye. It's the largest eye out of any snake on the planet. So this one would be a female, Naivasha green female, and in threat display. So they puff up their throat, obviously not like a cobra where it comes up sideways. It's just puffing up the, the throat and filling it with air. So the females in Naivasha tend to be green, the males tend to be green and black. So like this, the majority black with just these green speckling coming through. And then you've got a juvenile. Generally speaking, juveniles will be a brown color with a speckling on the neck, but your brown head and green eye. As they get to about one meter to four foot, they start changing color more and more. So if you find a small green snake in Naivasha, it's not a worry. It's not going to be a green mamba or a boom slang. It's going to be I'll, I'll, one of the green snakes, which will pop up just now in the, in the display. Another little venomous snake, um, unlikely to see. I think in Naivasha for the last 15 years, myself and Benji have only found one of these, and it was Benji while he was excavating. It's a variable burrowing asp. They spend most of their time underground, but when it's raining a lot, sometimes they get flushed out or when you're digging dams or foundation of a house, sometimes people will find one. Like we said, a small snake, 30 to 50 centimeters. We're not really sure how many eggs they could have. I think the only one they ever found was a dead one in Uganda, which had six eggs in it. And I've said potentially life-threatening. There've been two fatalities from this snake, but both of them are from Central Africa. Um, so it is potentially life-threatening, but there's no anti-venom. So you would go to hospital and they would have to treat you symptomatically. And it's, one of the, it's a weird snake where you can't actually safely hold it. You can't hold it behind the back of the head. Because they hunt rodents and things underground, they've got an ability to move their fang out the side of their mouth and independently move fangs. So you can't hold them behind the back of the head, otherwise you get nipped on your finger. Boniface, the snake farm manager, got bitten by one of these. He's actually been bitten twice by one. Um, and then the last one on the dangerous side of snakes, I've put uh, Southern African python. Not so dangerous. The likelihood of one being big enough around here to actually constrict and kill someone is incredibly slim. But a bite from one can leave pretty bad lacerations and would need medical attention, stitching and so on. Um, so the danger factor, I haven't put it too high unless you're catching one and you manage to get it constricting you around your neck, but I don't think most of you will need to worry about that. Um, but yeah, their length generally up to 5.5 meters. Like I said, similar to other snakes, everyone's got a story of seeing a 25 foot one, but until I see it, I don't know if I'm gonna believe it. Um, they can have up to a hundred eggs. 
So their nests um, will generally be in cavities. So either a warthog hole or a cavity in one of the rocks down at the lake or some, something along those lines. And what happens is the females will come out and bask themselves and go and incubate the eggs. So multiple times in the day, they'll come out and let their body temperature get dangerously high, then go back down, incubate the eggs and come back. So that's the closest thing to parental care we're gonna have in African snakes. Nothing else really has anything. Most of them will just lay their eggs and go or have their live babies and go separate ways. This one was actually caught in the Mara not too long ago. Yeah, let me say not everything kills. We don't, you know, a lot of Kenyans like to say nyoka ni nyoka, and the only, only good snakes are dead snakes. Obviously, that's not the case. From the common friendly snakes of Naivasha, the first one I've got is a rhombic egg eater, which doesn't even have teeth. So if you got bitten by this snake and were whinging about the pain, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> um, generally speaking, quite easy to identify. You've got these lovely patterning all around the back, which is mimicking a rhombic night adder. But I haven't seen any rhombic night adders or heard of any recently or ever in Naivasha. So that's not too much of a problem. And then the other one would be a northern striped bellied sand snake. There's a general rule with snakes in Kenya. Anything with stripes going down the body isn't dangerous, but anything with bands going across the body, don't pick it up. Yeah. Like the one on the left. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the um, sand snake is slightly venomous. So it is rear fang, and if it bit you, you might get a bit of swelling. But yeah, nothing that a panadol won't sort out. Um, going on, these two are probably the most common snake, or two of the most common snakes you'll see by quite some distance. This is called a white lip snake. In Southern Africa, they're called herald snakes. Generally speaking, a bite from one would hurt, but again, you're not gonna need any medical attention. And identifying them is relatively easy. You've got this nice shiny body with white spots on the back. You can't see them too well here, but they generally have speckling and a very iridescent head. And when they're aggressive, they turn their head into triangular shape. So I do get sent photos of people saying, what kind of viper is this? And it's just a white lip snake. And then brown house snake, which is probably the most common snake in Africa, or in particular Kenya. Um, again, this one, they do have teeth, but no venom. So a bite will just draw a little bit of blood, but nothing too bad. They do come in a different, different color morphs from brown to red to black to olivey green. So brown house snake really wasn't the best name to name them. But the best way to identify them is you've got this nice line through the head with an um, elliptical pupil. So like I said, if you see a shiny snake and it's got the elliptical pupil, a shiny little snake, generally speaking, you'll be all right. It's got a round pupil, you might not, but I don't expect everyone to be looking at the snake's eyes trying to identify it. Yeah. And then the last two of the friendly ones I've done is the green snakes that you get in, in Naivasha, um, which is the Battersby green snake, which is far more common. And anyone who's got ponds or anything around their house, you would likely have seen a good handful of these. They come to eat the frogs. And then it's other close relative, which is a spotted bush snake, which you tend to find a little bit further away from the lake where it's a bit drier. Um, so the three green snakes you'll find in Naivasha will be Bumslang, Battersby green snake, and spotted bush snake. But these ones will barely get over a meter and they're normally pretty thin. And remember a boom slang under a meter is normally gray to brown in color. So you don't need to worry too much. And you're looking for that eye. Boom slangs have got just the most enormous eye. So keeping snakes away, it's really simple things. You just wanna limit your hiding places. So any kind of building materials or rubble, you're just giving them places to hide as well as rodents. A tidy garden, so in particular, if you don't want puff adders, you want to keep your grass nice and short, because then even if they are there, at least they're visible, and you won't end up with it attached to the end of your toe. Um, and a clean house and staff area. So the main thing is standing water and food like posho and stuff lying around brings in rodents, which then brings in the snakes pretty quickly. And it's a chain 
chain effect. You get puff adders and you get mice, you'll end up with cobras and it just escalates. So the cleaner everything is, the, the more luck you'll have at keeping them away. You will see advertised online um, snake repellents. Snake repellents are a bit of a waste of time. So they're either one of two things. They're either a herbal snake repellent, which has no, we have no proof that works, or as you see here, snakes are multi advanced multicellular vertebrates. So anything with the capability of repelling a snake would be pretty toxic for you. You wouldn't want to run people or pets. So I wouldn't advise spreading cyanide around your house to keep a few snakes away. There's a lot of cultural beliefs as well. You would have heard, um, I don't know, some, some people say snakes don't like the smell of burning rubber. There's no proof of that, but it may work. But can you justify burning rubber around your house 365 days a year? I'm not sure. So on to snake bites. Um, I don't want to scare you with all of this, the snake bites, but it's just general statistics so you can see what, what is happening around the world and the kind of pandemic that we're actually facing. So snake bite was recently added as a neglected tropical disease, which will get us more funding, hopefully to treat it and combat it worldwide. But you're looking at 1.8, 2.7 million people worldwide are being envenomated by snakes. 81,000 to 138,000 of those people will die. Um, and 400,000 people are left with permanent, um, permanent dis disabilities, which cause an economic strain and um, physiological strain on the people of that country. On to Kenya. So Kenya, we're looking at about a thousand snake bite deaths a year. This number is an average of what we know. The likelihood is it's quite a lot higher. So when you've got people being bitten by snakes in northern and eastern and some of the more remote parts of Kenya, when they don't make it to hospital and do die from snake bite, it doesn't actually get registered. So the likelihood is it is slightly higher. On average for the last, I think it's 10 years, we get 4,022 amputations. So things, or I say amputations and disabilities. So the puff adders, the carpet vipers and the spitting cobras are our three culprits for that because they've got the cytotoxic venom. And even if it's not a full amputation, what ends up happening is you get a lot of what we call skip lesions. And when that skin heals, people end up with disabilities like you can't straighten your leg because all the skin now is healed in a way that it locks the joints. Um, I don't know if you knew, KWS used to compensate people for human wildlife conflict. They had to stop that because 44.8% of all human wildlife conflict in Kenya was from snake bite. Um, and that led to what 43.1% of all fatalities are snake bite and 76.9% um, of all the injuries are still snake bite. And the numbers just got too big and KWS ended up owing too much money in compensation. And people started, as you do in Kenya, finding ways around it and burning themselves with coals and stuff, saying it was a snake bite and getting their payout. So that no longer happens. When we say 80% of snake bites are dry, these are people who've come into hospital with a snake bite and it's either a non-venomous snake or it's a venomous snake which has chosen not to deliver its venom. I would stick to the majority of them will be non-venomous snakes but it's hard to be sure. Okay, so snake bite first aid. So snake bite first aid is an interesting one because there actually isn't a huge amount you can do, but there's things that you shouldn't do. And I have this argument with a few people. Um, the big don'ts. So I know you watch snakes on a plane or something, you'll have people cutting the snake wound and trying to suck the venom out with olive oil in their mouth or something like that. It's not gonna work. It's gonna cause more stress on the person. But also by cutting a snake bite wound, you've now left an area one susceptible for infection and the venom tends to do a lot of damage around there and you get a lot of hemorrhaging. So it's not a good idea. The big one for people around the country is performing electric shock treatment. So at one stage, a company in America was selling essentially tasers and they were saying you got bitten by a snake, electrocute yourself on the bite site, and the electric electricity will neutralize the snake venom. There's no proof of this working. And some people swear by it. 
but the reality is from what from what we can see there's two things what happens when you get electrocuted one it stresses the person out so their heart rate starts beating faster transporting the blood the venom in the blood around the body a little bit quicker and then the other thing is a lot of venom actually travels in your lymphatic system and your lymphatic system is transported around your body by muscle movements so now when you get electrocuted all your muscles are naturally tense again you're pushing the venom around your body faster so we really don't recommend electrocuting people and some people will say yeah but this person would have died without without the electrocution if you take a puff adder for, ex for um, example only 40 percent of people who get bitten by puff adders will die even with without anti-venom so just because they didn't die doesn't mean the electrocution worked they might have been fine in the first place so it's a bit of a tricky one that um, apply a tourniquet we don't recommend because obviously a tourniquet you're tightening it as much as you can and for instance if you're bitten on the leg and you tie your tourniquet too or tight as you would you've now prevented all the blood from going to that limb so if it doesn't get any blood within a certain amount of time the limb will actually die and need to be amputated anyway um, the other thing is the, ven the venom can get trapped or when it is trapped in a single part of your body it's actually doing a hell of a lot more damage now because it's concentrated in one area of the body, um, in particular with your cytotoxic snakes. So it just increases the chances of leading to an amputation. You would be better off actually letting the venom kind of slowly transport your body and let it fight it at its own pace. We did have an instance a while back, I believe it was in Nigeria, where someone came in after a night um, after a night with a tourniquet around their leg after being bitten by a snake and they had to amputate the leg because there hadn't been enough oxygen. Once they amputated the leg, they had a further inspection to see if there was any venom or anything that could indicate a venomous snake bite. There was no venom in the leg. So they lost their leg for no, no reason. We say don't wash the bite, again, because you don't want to be massaging the bite area, massaging the venom in, rather leave it. If well, when you get to hospital, they'll likely rub a antiseptic swab over it so it's not a problem and then we don't want to inject anti-venom as a first aid so a lot of people will ask where they can buy anti-venom and stock it it's not a very good method because if you administer anti-venom to yourself and go into anaphylaxis because of it you're going to die quicker than what the venom would do you still need a medical pro uh, professional to administer the venom and treat treat your symptoms so the do's, the main thing is you're just trying to keep them calm, which is a lot easier said than done when someone's just been bitten by a cobra. People tend to panic a little bit. Um, so you just want to keep them calm, get them to hospital, rather drive them to hospital, because if you get bitten by a, a, a neurotoxic snake, you can lose consciousness. So if you're driving yourself, you might end up having a car crash as well. Um, rather get driven to hospital, um, and on the way there, start removing rings, watches, any kind of jewelry or tight clothing. With a lot of these cytotoxic snakes, wherever you've been bitten tends to swell up quite a lot. And if you do have a ring or a watch and it swells up to the point you can't get it off, again, you've now cut the blood supply to that part of the body and it could lead to an amputation. Um, we say apply a pressure bandage. And I'll, the next slide will show you how to do a pressure bandage. It's really important with this. You can't do it with any cytotoxic snakes. So anything neurotoxic. In Ivasha, rarely you're just focusing on Egyptian cobras. And sometimes Egyptian cobras can show cytotoxic effects, in which case you would take the pressure bandage off. But um, rarely you just want to do it for neurotoxic snakes. So it's aiming for Egyptian cobra, black mamba, green mamba, Jameson's mamba, and forest cobra. Those are the five snakes you really focus on. If you were going to a hospital in Navasha, yeah. which hospital would you go? <laughs> uh, this is a good question. Oh. We're trying to do some training for a lady at its Nairobi Women's Hospital. Yeah. And then it was Finley's, isn't it, Mum? Finley's? Uh, yeah, and the Finley's yeah. Clinic. Yeah, so we're going to try and do the two of those to get, uh, to get those doctors there trained. Um, hopefully by the next snake bite seminar, which might be next year, but we're trying to work it out. Obviously, COVID's made everything difficult because we try and get professionals in. So traveling for people over the last couple of years has been quite difficult. 
but I would aim for Nairobi Women's Hostel or aim for Nairobi. Your best bet would still be to get to Nairobi. Dr. Butt is, no, Dr. Butt, um, Sayo has treated multiple snake bites and you will have more than enough time to get there. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if everyone knows first aid and CPR, but again, if you were bitten by an Egyptian cobra and someone did lose consciousness, you're gonna to need to start doing compressions. Because once that, once the venom does take, take effect, your diaphragm will stop working. Generally, we're speaking after a good couple of hours. So you do have time to get to hospital. The myth of people getting bitten by a snake and dropping dead in five minutes, that's normally from people dying from anaphylaxis of the snake venom itself. So saying snakes can kill you in five minutes is incorrect. Because I could say peanuts can kill you in five minutes. It doesn't, it's the same thing. Generally speaking, you've got time, which is a, the main thing. Are you yep. In the earlier talk, Ronnie did as well, he just mentioned to everybody that if they get bitten by a snake and have to get on the other body to go in there, basically, go with three people. So one, the driver in front, somebody holding, passing proper height, and they say, sorry, Ollie, yeah. heat it up so that that virtual audience can hear you. Okay. Okay. No, what was said was just earlier on, um, if the mode of transport to get yourself to hospital is in a bodder bodder um, or a motorbike. Ideally, you want to go three people, the rider, the patient, and someone at the back propping the patient up in case they lose consciousness. Yeah. Um, so with a compression bandage or pressure bandage, you want to start at the bite site. So over the actual bite, go a little bit towards the end of the limb and then back all the way up to the top joint. We do recommend you add a, a splint of some kind in there. Because remember when I said muscle movement um, moves your lymphatic system, which then transports the venom further. So a splint just prevents the temptation to do that. Okay, and then venom in the eyes. The main thing with, if a spitting cobra does spit at you and they can spit accurately to about close to nine foot, and we say 12 foot max, but nine foot. The best plan of action is just to rinse the eyes with water. So ideally under a slow running tap, because you don't want to have a pressure washer in your eye either. You just want a nice, slow, steady flow of water just to get the venom particles off the, the cornea and it'll stop any damage. If there is no water, you can use any bland liquid. So you're kind of looking beer, soda, milk. Milk's the big one that everyone tries to use, but even urine. Um, we say use uh, paracetamol as a painkiller just because it doesn't thin the blood too much. You don't want to thin your blood when you've got venom transporting in it. And then the days that follow, maybe try and stay away from any bright light um, and too much strain on the eye, uh, followed by going to opticians for some antibiotic eye drops. That's just to prevent any further infection. So in Sambu, a couple of years ago, I was unfortunate enough to get spat out in the eye. I've still got the snake here. And Mikey, my uncle, did offer to piss in my eyes, but I chose the water. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you just want to flush that water out, the water, flush the venom out of the eyes, and then you should be fine. Were you wearing your sunglasses? Or you get... So I, yeah, I get a lot of flack from, again, my mother. When I was catching it, what happened was it was wrapped around a rock and I had its tail in one hand and I had my glasses on and its head popped around the other side. And I can't, it was Gary Hopcroft actually was there and he said, it's heads this side. And as I poked my head around, my glasses slipped down my face and it spat and got me in both eyes. And then I just, I quickly managed to catch it, get it behind the head and then it was a good 20 minutes of proper flushing to get it out of my eyes. Yeah. I can tell you it hurts. <laughs> so there's no, if you get spat at, you're not going to be thinking, did it get me? Did it not? You're going to know about it. It's like someone pouring petrol in your eyes. Yes, if you get spat at too much by spitting cobras, you can build an allergy to it. So, 
It's just more inhaling it actually, because if it spits at you, you get particles in your into your lungs and you breathe them in, and over time you can build allergies to that. So, touch wood, I'm all right. I haven't had that, but the likes of Royan, the likes of Charlie Wright, a couple of other handlers, Boniface, they're all starting, or Charlie and Boniface are starting to build the allergy. Benji's got the allergy, um, but Royan was so allergic to the venom just being in the air. If I got spat at. And I walked into his house, he knew I'd been spat at before I even got in. And he said he'd start feeling himself swelling at the throat. Like I said, the main point is just having a, a plan of action for when you do get bitten or spat at. Just like you said, keep the patient calm. My emergency protocol would be to phone the emergency snake bite number, which will normally be Claire Taylor, who answers. Um, and then apply the pressure bandage in the case of a Egyptian cobra, otherwise just get the patient in the back of a car and drive them to hospital. And you should be all right. And if you're in Northern Kenya, flying doctors would always be the best plan of action. And they can land at Nanyuki because Dr. Butt, he quite likes the idea of treating snake bites. So it excites him. It's always a good plan to go there. Yeah, so the other little bits and bobs that we do do, uh, the community education, like we said, generally in these more remote parts of Kenya, it's a little bit harder to teach people to conserve snakes, in particular when they are biting people and we've got um, fatalities. So we're, we're trying to educate people on mitigating snake bite itself so we can move in a step forward to protect them. Like we said, school education, that's a big one because obviously kids have their um, cultural beliefs that get passed down to them. My biggest Quest is teaching Maasai and Samburu not to kill snakes. So they believe for every snake you kill, you extend your lifespan. So it's quite hard trying to fight that battle, but it's yeah, it's ongoing. So snake bite, also oh, snake removal. Myself and Benji do removals in Naivasha, and if we're not around, we'll get one of the other handlers to do it. We do do it free of charge, but obviously with fuel prices skyrocketing. It's always appreciated if our fuel money can be covered. And we're more than happy. So yeah, that's Benji who will pop around if it's not me. Um, the field work education. So this is, in, again, in the more remote parts of Kenya, really trying to teach lodges um, and places like Takana in the wind project, solar project, the importance of having snakes. But I feel a lot of these properties in Kenya promote conservation but are very happy to kill a snake behind the doors. And unfortunately conservation, you know, it can't just be convenient when it's benefiting you. Conservation needs to be part of the whole ecosystem. So that's another big one I'm trying to fight. And then I'm sure a lot of you would have had the old East African Snakes and Other Reptiles book by Steve Spools is the main author. Um, the second edition is fantastic. You can get it at the bookstop in Nairobi. Otherwise, there's free uh, PDFs which you can download off the kenyareptileatlas.com or kenyareptileatlas.com. Um, those will do, it doesn't cover everything, but it covers the venomous snakes in their family groups. So it's a good little, little piece of information to read. The emergency contacts, what I might do is pop back onto this page after a couple of minutes, um, just so everyone can write down the number. We don't need to to rush too much. But the snake removal numbers, like I said, it'll either be myself or Benji, or if there happens to be another one of our handlers in Naivasha, we'll, we'll phone them and arrange them to come. Kyle it will do snake, uh, snake removals to the rest of the country, kind of orchestrate where to go. And then obviously the snake bite number, which will be Claire. And if she's out of country, it'll normally be Kyle or someone else at the farm who will answer it and advise where to go. I can share that on the North Yeah. Okay, perfect. Please. How to help? So one of the best ways to help is by supporting the Taylor Ash Anti-Venom Fund. So any donations to that go towards, um, again, like all will go towards educating snake bite health workers, anyone who's gonna be dealing with it, and as well as helping supply impoverished people in Africa for anti-venom, like we said, Kenya. Our plan is to expand, but at the moment, we need to get the Kenya snake bite 
issues under control and then we can expand into East Africa, hopefully Central, and see where we go from there. Otherwise, I'm sure a lot of you would have been to the snake park. At the moment, it's under big overhauls. So we've got a whole new venom lab where you can see the snakes being milked. Um, and it's behind the safety of a glass, so you don't need to worry about a black mamba coming, tearing between your legs. In Watamu. In Watamu, yeah. Um, and yeah, so open seven days a week, but the milking only happens on weekdays. So not on weekends, we, we don't do it on weekends. Great, so thank you very much. And then um, what I think we'll do quickly, I'll take the puff adder out and then we can finish with questions. So rather get that out, out the way. So what I'll do with this puff adder, I'll get it out, everyone can have a look at it. Then just after that, I'll show you a simple way of getting it into a bucket or a box. Um, and then I'll show you the design of this box and why I think this is the easiest way to do it. Okay. We have to see what kind of mood she's in as well. <laughs> Great. So this is your kind of typical Naivasha, Gilgil kind of area, female puff adder. So they tend not to be too bright. The males might be bright yellow. Females tend to just be either brownish, gray. So when I say getting them into a bucket, what I would recommend, obviously, I think most of you would be using a little bit longer of a stick than this. <laughs> If you can kind of coax them and direct them in a way towards the bucket is the best way, but sometimes they can be a little bit stubborn. So you kind of want to just slowly and gently, the, gen the more gentle you are, the more calm the snake stays as well. They have a tendency to like having something behind them because it means you can't, but nothing can attack them from behind. So they like to be in a space where they can just defend themselves from the front. So if you had a bucket and you turned it over, you can chase it into the bucket very gently. And if they're taking their time, you can slowly just coax them in. You would then hold the bucket at a place, obviously, where your hand's not in danger of being bitten. Slowly turn it over. And the nice thing with buckets, <laughs> the nice thing with buckets is you can hold the top of a bucket normally in the middle. So you don't need to worry about putting your fingers in like this and getting bitten on the end of the finger. You can just place the bucket lid directly on top and they can't really strike too far up. So you would have just closed it off and then ideally take it out as quickly as you can because if the bucket doesn't have holes in it, it will suffocate. But being cold blooded, it doesn't need as much oxygen. So just take it out to a nice safe area and then let it go on its way on your neighbor's <laughs> garden or somewhere. No, generally take it a little bit further than that. So you kind of want to take it a good two, three kilometers away minimum. Yeah. This is just for puff adders. I don't expect any of you to go out trying to wrangle a cobra into a bucket. Okay. Then the reason I like the buckets, uh, the boxes like this, is you can see so lock it from the top. But snakes, what they tend to do is like I said, they'd like having the protection of a wall or something behind them. So if you see them slithering around your house, they'll generally be slithering along the wall. Um, so what you can do is sit it almost flush to the wall. You can't with this one, but in a bucket, you couldn't sit flush to the wall. So they tend to go between the wall and the bucket instead of into the bucket. You open your little door for it. And then same thing, I'll do it with the end of the stick because you'll likely be using a broomstick or something. And I said, just gently coax it to the wall and direct it in the way of the, the box in the hole. 
and then you don't really need to do anything more once you get it going the right direction. Go on. So you just want to prevent it from going between the gap of the wall and the, the box. And direct her head into the hole. And snakes have a natural tendency to hide in holes. It's going to be stubborn now, I can see it. There you go. And then you don't need to do too much more than that. She'll do the rest herself. <laughs> okay, I didn't. Okay. And then obviously, if you're going to shut that hole, don't use your hand because it might come shooting out. Just use your stick or whatever you've got, close it, and then you can lock it nicely. Done. Yeah, so I've got little little breathing holes. So being, like I said, being cold-blooded, they're not going to use up nearly as much um, oxygen as a mammal. So you don't need to worry too much. Um, but yeah, you still want it, want enough air for it to, to go a little while and keep it in a cool spot. So if you get it in a bucket, obviously you're not going to leave it out in the middle of the garden. Otherwise you'll come back to a medium rare cooked snake. Perfect. Let me just get this, the, the numbers. Great. Our, yeah. Um, Dalmatian got bitten about a couple of years, a year and a half ago. And we spoke about, I got hold of Jilly Fraser. Yeah. Jilly Fraser said, inject the dog with this stuff. I give it to my horses. And I think it was called Calvison. I I, yeah, I think I have heard of it. It's more of an anti-inflammatory, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. gave her two cc's. She wanted to give three. She said three. We gave her two. And when the dog survived, we took her to the local vet who put her on the drip. And we spoke to he, he spoke to the uh, a vet in the Kuru called Hassan. Yeah. Who said, What have you done so far? And we said we've given her two cc's of his calcium. And he says, That's good, but give her another two. Uh, yeah, she survived, but I think it was because the puff had only got her a glass in blood. We were phoned uh, Jonathan Leakey, yeah, who was a very, very good friend of ours, late Jonathan. Yeah, and he said, Try and get the wound to bleed. It was already bleeding, so I've got a picture of it, and she was breathing down the, the muscle. So I think it, the snake only got her a glass in blood. I yeah, she's fine now, but uh. Yeah, no. So I'll just repeat some of the questions just so the online audience can can hear it. So with pets, the the main problem with dogs and other other pets when they do get bitten is they often get bitten on the muzzle. And what happens is it's not so much the venom killing them that quickly, is it's the swelling right. closes the airways. So by giving them certain anti-inflammatories, that can help. What we in some places you can get expired antivenom, but the reality of it is there's just not enough antivenom in Kenya to be giving antivenom to animals, unfortunately. That time, yeah, you said that yeah. Uh, the problem is all the antivenom, like we said, is, is stocked. Sometimes when there's expired antivenom and some vets will get that, the dogs will be given it or whatever animal it is, but there's just not enough antivenom in Kenya to treat people, let alone. So we need to get to a stage where, where all of, where we can distribute some of the ex more of the expired antivenom around. Yeah. Is the antivenom particular to a particular type of snake? Okay, so with regards to antivenom being for the specific species, um, depending on which manufacturer, um, but generally speaking, it's not. A lot of the antivenoms are what we call polyvalent antivenoms, which work for a multitude of different snakes. So if you were bitten by a black mamba, puff adder, or spitting cobra, the likelihood is you will be given the same antivenom. Yeah. Certain ones still have their own. So what we call monovalent antivenoms. So if you got bitten by a bum slang or a carpet viper, generally speaking, those have their own antivenoms. Yeah. So that's why it's good to take a picture. Yeah. But we don't, yeah, we want a picture, but often we don't need it. If you were to come in, just by the symptoms you're showing and the area you were bitten, we can piece together what bit you. So it's not a necessity. Because the last thing that we need is people 
one person being bitten and someone going and trying to take a photo or kill the snake and getting bitten as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> The here in the election, sorry. Yeah. Will have anti venom in stock. I'm I can't say for sure just yet. Um potentially, but like I said, I think your best bet would still be to go to Nairobi. Like I said, if you get bitten by a puff adder, you've got hours to get to hospital, five, ten, sometimes longer. Um, but just get yourself to Nairobi and that's your best bet. Yeah, Holly, and then we'll Three virtual questions for your representatives from nine countries online now. Tell us what they'd like to please go over applying a pressure bandage again. Okay, so applying a pressure bandage. Um, I'll get it in a second. It's just here. Applying a pressure bandage. So you're just gently, gently applying bandage over the bite site generally if it's on a limb is where you want to be doing a pressure bandage down to the bottom of the limb and then all the way back up to the first joint but you're doing it in a way that you're not restricting blood flow you still need blood flow going through you just want it to slowly move around the body so if you finished your tourniquet or your sorry not your tourniquet your pressure bandage and You've, there's no longer blood coming into the end of your fingers and you can't see the color change if you push the end of your finger or your toe or whatever it might be, you've done it too tight. It needs to have blood flow. Rather do it not tight enough than too tight. Um, like you said, it's optional, but you can add a splint in it to prevent limb movement, which slows down movement of the venom as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so as Kyle, Kyle says, the, the idea is, Priority getting to hospital. So if you are doing, um, if you are applying the pressure bandage, the good idea would be to do it on the way or any kind of first aid, keeping the patient calm, all that, get them in a car, being your priority number one, and get moving. Yeah. Just keep it, yeah, level. Uh, maybe not necessarily lower, just keep it level. So if you're lying down, yeah, that would be ideal. Do you do that for the neurotoxic? So neurotoxic snakes don't have too much internal damage because it's just shutting down the electrical systems in your body. So by by slowing the blood flow, it's not going to do long lasting damage around the bite site. Whereas a puff adder or a spitting cobra, by having that venom stay in areas for longer, the necrosis tends to be a lot worse. So you kind of want those snakes to the venom to be fought by your entire body system. The other thing with those cytotoxic snakes is generally speaking, you've got a lot longer to get to hospital. So you know, you're not in so much of a rush of slowing it down. It's just taking it step by step. Yeah. Did you say, uh, no, so the uh, Bunslang's venom is hemotoxic. Hemo, which is prevents the blood from clotting. Let's answer just, oh, can we do one more virtual and then, no. <laughs> And then I'll go back. Okay. So, yeah, this is an interesting question. Um, what the way I'll put it, not necessarily just snake handlers. The way I'll I'll phrase it is: Is it possible? to inject venom into yourself and produce a natural immunity to snake venom. And it is possible. There is a guy, if you look hard enough on the internet, you will find him, who has been doing this for years. I forget his name. And he's gotten to the stage where he can take a black mamba bite on one arm and a coastal taipan on the other within five minutes of each other, which is the coastal taipan is the third most venomous snake on the planet. And he survives. He's that immune to the venom. He has been in the ICU multiple times. So if a snake handler is volunteering to do it, by all means, they can. His idea wasn't so much extracting his blood and producing antivenoms using his blood. He was thinking of studying his blood and finding a way to produce a vaccine. So you could be vaccinated annually against snake bite. In theory, there's potential for it. But we're not there yet. So I wouldn't recommend it just yet, but there is potential for it to work in the future. But at the moment, 
we're not there. There's the science isn't there to produce a vaccine for snake bites just yet. Yeah. A main process of that is there are so many different species of snakes as well. And a snake species, venom can vary from locality to locality. So if you're bitten by a black mamba in coastal areas of Kenya versus a black mamba in the Kerio Valley in the western side of the country, their venom is actually pretty different and one could be more toxic than the other. I'm not saying the anti-venom won't work, but I'm just proving that their, their venom does vary quite a lot, which makes it complicated. So <laughs> depend on their conditions and what they're eating. Yes. Eating. Yeah. Just microevolution will will result in that. Just living in slightly different areas, food scarcity, a lot of little variants. Yeah. yeah. No, I just yeah. had a question about the angle bag because I was told once with this with the neurotoxin that's going to shut down your ability to breathe. Yeah. If you have one of those angle bags, that can save a life as you drive to hospital. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So that that. It would be the same as um, breathing, essentially, in CPR, but obviously it's a lot easier to do it. You do want to still, with, still continue with the compressions because some of these neurotoxic snakes have another little toxin called a cardiotoxin, which shuts down the heart's involuntary beat. So you still want to be doing compressions. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Another online one quickly. Yeah. yeah. If the sleeping cobra bites you, is that as venomous as it's sitting Well, okay. So the question is, is, is it as venomous? Um, if you get spat in the eye, you don't have too much danger of dying. But if you get bitten, spitting cobras do have a toxic venom, which has the ability um, to kill. So they're more, the, you'd rather be spat in the eye than bitten, let's put it that way. Yeah, so they're more, more to it's a more toxic bite than a spit. Yeah. Yeah. Loads more. We'll do. Yeah. If you just be something like Egyptian cobra, on average, how many vials have been seen? Oh, so this is quite a tricky question. Okay. The question was if you were bitten by an Egyptian cobra, how many vials of antenna would it take? This is a tricky question because it comes down to a lot of factors. It depends what antivenom you're being given um, and where the antivenom was made. As far as I know, I might be stand to be corrected, the Kenyan Egyptian cobras aren't being used to make antivenom anywhere. So we were having a bit of a problem with Egyptian cobras. Bite. If, if you were to get a bite, it would have taken a huge amount of vials of antivenom. I can't tell you exactly how many, but because because they hadn't been using Kenyan Egyptian cobras with this particular venom, it, it could be a lot, a hell of a lot more. I think once we were looking at something like 18, but I might be corrected, 18 vials, where a puff adder is normally two or three. So is, it weight, is the anti-venom weight-based? Depending on like, are you getting? Okay, so with anti-venom, the quantity you get, it, there's a lot of variants. Yes, sometimes someone who's larger and a, a man being bitten versus a kid comes into effect, but some people do just deal with venom very differently in their bodies. So not necessarily, sometimes people might just have a slightly better tolerance to it, but yeah, weight and size does come into it a little bit. Yeah. What's the difference between an Egyptian cobra and a forest cobra? So they're, they're actually, um, so, Sorry, the difference between an Egyptian cobra and a forest cobra, they're actually very completely different species, yeah. So uh, Egyptian cobras have got a clade of different species, which used to stretch all the way from Egypt all the way down to Southern Africa, and they've slowly been cutting them up into different species. So they've split up a little bit, where forest cobras are generally found in more tropical forest. So you tend to find them down the East African coast in the forest coastline, the coastal belt, and then into the Central African forest and all the way to the west. And they also have just been split into five new species. So they are completely separate species, but their venom is similar in the way that they're both majority neurotoxic. Yeah. Is it true snakes can't hear? So snakes have no external ears or osidomes, so they can't hear any, not too much of us like talking and uh, vocalization through the air but they do have an auditory nerve which runs along their jaw. 
so they can feel vibrations through the ground. Yeah. I came back from Wakama. I'll keep it short. Yeah. I came back from Wakama to Sankara once, mm -hmm. and there had been a top ladder being used that just fell. And he was really irritated. So when you walk yeah. past the, the cage or whatever, yeah. puffing. And I'd never heard of puffing. And I was yeah. sitting on friend's veranda here in Green Park telling them about this snake and I was imitating it. And I'm not, I'm not kidding, a minute later, a really big puff out of it. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. I said, I used to be frustrated on, but then you know, I'm <laughs> saying, how did that happen? And someone said, maybe it's a vibration or total coincidence, you just made this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, there might be something into it. But my guess would be more coincidence. Right, right into the yeah. <laughs> so the, they do say the auditory nerve is sensitive enough to pick up a certain amount of vibration um, through the air. So like when we're speaking, but I don't, I'm not sure it's advanced enough for calling them in. Because if it was, I'd be walking around the garden doing it all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yes, Holly. The snake you dealt with in the box. Can you talk about different snakes of different speeds and where you put your hands in closing the box? <laughs> okay. okay, so coming to different snakes and putting them in boxes, um, really there's a huge variety of different speeds and temperament of snakes. If you're putting them into that little cavity, the hole, generally speaking, they're going to go in as quickly as they can. The puff adder might sl slither in relatively slow. A cobra or a black mamba or something along those lines, if it's ready to go in there, it will go in really quickly. And that's why I say you, when you're shutting the hole, you want to use the stick. You don't want to put your hands there. And I've had it before when I'm closing it with the stick and a cobra quickly sticks its head back out or something. So speed wise, all the vipers will generally do it quite slowly. And then your lapids, which are Cobras and mambas tend to be much faster moving and wiry snakes. But in a similar way, the slower you act and more calm you are, you can maneuver them in a way to get them to go in the hole at their own speed and not too much of a, of a dash. The other thing to remember, snakes aren't as fast as all, all of us think. Even black mambas on open ground, I've got confidence that every, everyone here could get away. <laughs> You're looking at it. Some people say 19 kilometers per hour. I don't think there's any accurate stat of how fast a black member is, but over open ground, you should be more than fast enough. Up a tree, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I have a question. Yes. Is there snake protective gear? Okay, so the question was in regards to snake protective gear. Um, I presume you mean gaiters and yeah, so. The main thing would be gaiters. There are, is a company which we um, are affiliated with and make a lot of our snake catching equipment that do knee height snake proof gaiters. Um, so if you're worried about walking, you can get those walking around in the long grass. I think the main thing is just being aware they're there and keeping an eye out for them. But yes, you can get snake high gaiters. Clothes to shoe, shoes help a bit. Um, you can get a face mask if you're worried about spitting cobras. But yeah, it depends how you might look a bit silly walking around wearing gaiters a full face shield. And but yeah, if if you are in a snake area and walking in long grass, gaiters are there's nothing. It could be advisable to get them. And we say snake, the bite is resistant. So I couldn't say buy them and then you get bitten through them and then we've got a problem. But yeah, the the company is called ASI, African Snake Bite Institute, which is a Southern African company run by a man called Johan Maria. Um, so that's what I would recommend if you're worried about protective gear. I think Holly had another one online. We have someone in from Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda who wants to go over the cup at a bite thing. Okay. Um, with puff at a bite first aid, the main thing is, again, like I said, keeping the patient calm. There'll be a lot of pain and a lot of swelling. So ideally, you want to get them in the back of a car um, and keep it while keeping them calm, get them to hospital as quickly as you can. The main thing with puff adders to remember is you do have a lot of time. Generally speaking, five or more hours, five to 10 hours, you've got a decent amount of time to get yourself to hospital. Um, but by the time you get them there, the longer you wait, the more pain they're going to be in and the higher the chance of 
implications are towards amputations. Yeah. 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 Do you ever find a man in um, in the rift like from here to Ronga? Um, as it starts dropping, I I don't want to say you don't because in the rift you do. Once you start dropping down, dropping down towards Bogoria, Beringo, you get lots of lots of mambas. Um, generally speaking, with black mambas in Kenya, what we say is anything over six thousand feet, you won't get them. Um, just a general rule of thumb, but never say never. So this part of the rift, Gogar, you could potentially get them. Yeah. Skinny. It could be. It could be. I don't want to say no because. Yeah, but it's just generally speaking. Yeah, anything over six thousand feet, we stop. There was one found on Leo the other day, Bat in Craig's house, I think it was. And that, that was a little bit over 6,000 feet. So you do get the odd one popping up in areas that they shouldn't be. But yeah, Naivasha, no. I don't know, what's the altitude? Google might be a little bit lower. 62, same, same. Yeah. Well, like I said, as you drop further north into the Rift Valley, into the Gregory Rift, you start you start getting a lot. All that band towards Bringa. Bringa is decent for you. Yeah. You mentioned something about black. Numbers. What about green numbers? So with regards to green members distribution in Kenya, um, they're pretty much a coastal snake. So you kind of just find them on the coastline and then you do get them up the Tana all the way to Meru, but only on the river and little pockets of them. Like extremely rare to find them further inland than, inland than that. Um, but if you were to go to Western Kenya, there is a third species of member, which is also green called a Jameson's member, kind of really finding it around more towards Kakamega, South Nandi. Um, and then you also, one was found on the escarpment above the Mara the other day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Holly. Do people work in Bantu with snakes? File snakes and mole snakes? Okay, so info on file snakes and mole snakes. Interestingly, mole snakes used to be very common. Um, around Naivasha, but this is a non-venomous snake that grows to a relatively large proportion. So any snake which is big is easier to be found. And when all the agriculture came in here, their numbers just plummeted. So if you would find a mole snake in Kenya, in Naivasha now, it's much, much rarer, but um, they, they do get sizable, um, non-venomous, but a bite from one would hurt. It would tickle a bit. Um, file snakes in Kenya, you do get a, a fair few file snakes. As far as I know, you don't get any in Naivasha, but you do get them on the coast. A couple of different species. Interesting thing about file snakes is then a non-venomous snake species, which predates mainly on venomous snakes and other snakes. So if you find a file snake, which has just got horrifically rough coarse scales, very killed, um, it's one of those snakes that you want to have around your garden because you know the chances are it's eating small puff adders, cobras, things like that. That's all fine for it. Yeah. Yeah. How much protection do gumboots give? How much protection? <laughs> to be to be fair, gumboots could give a relative amount of protection. Um, it would take quite a large snake to have a bite force to actually get through them. Something like a, a puff adder or one of the vipers, although they have long fans, fangs, don't actually have too much bite pressure. So you don't need to worry about the physical bite as much. Things like cobras tend to have a little bit more of a bulldog bite. So within reason, yes, gumboots could could provide a decent amount of protection from a snake bite. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What um, are You tend to find a lot of the spitting cobras very active at night. And in particular, hotter places in Kenya, puff adders tend to be a little bit more active at night. Up here, a little bit, but in the colder temperatures, they don't, you know, the later hours of the night, they're a bit lethargic. So it's mainly spitting cobras um, and, or cobras and puff adders, kind of your vipers can be quite active at night. Yeah. So with aggression, you said before that they're not aggressive, they're yeah. defensive. 
Yeah. Is it, can you sit, make a statement like that where you say, you know, a snake, if you're, if you're a good distance away, it's not going to chase you. Or yeah. <laughs> no. The only ones that are mammals. That's yeah. So if, I think a lot of the folklore when it comes to snakes chasing people, there's two stories that pop up quite a lot. Um, with regards to any snake, if you corner it, in particular mambas and cobras, they're more than happy to give you a bluff and charge you. And a charge will be a couple of meters. So if you turn and gap it, you should get far enough away and it's not gonna chase you more than a couple of meters until it feels like you're out of its vicinity and then it can cruise on. Um, so that's, that's most of it. Also, if you stumble across one, they, they're more than happy to stand up and hold their ground for a bit. But as long as you get far enough away, you'll be, you'll be all right. The second story where members get their, a lot of flack for being aggressive is you hear stories of people driving cars in Tanzania in particular. I don't know why it always happens to be Tanzania. And they'll be driving in relatively thick bush and grass. And all of a sudden, a man will appear out of the grass and slither into the side of the car. And it feels like they're attacking you. I think my explanation from it would be a car is sending a huge amount of vibrations through the ground. And what a mamba does, like a cobra, if it can't see where the threat's coming, it can lift a third of its body off the ground. And you're talking about a snake that can get over 12 foot long. So you've got four foot of, of mamba sitting up like this. And all of a sudden, it's got this car coming at it at speed. And it feels like it's not going to get away and it provokes it to defend itself. So it's not that it's seen a car from 20 meters away and is now sending it towards this car to fly in through the passenger window. And it has, this has actually happened to me, it happened to me in the Mara with a, with a member sitting up and eye level with the, my passenger in the front. Yeah. No, a fully open car. <laughs> I had him, I nearly had him on my lap. Yeah. <laughs> The snake or the person? The person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. This boom, is boom, for boom. you and probably some other people in the room. Judy and I have lived here now for about 11 years. We're at plus or minus 7,000 feet. Yeah. And in that time frame, we've only seen a spinning cobra and a puff adder. Yeah. So what other types of snakes would we most likely see at this altitude? Yeah. Um, so with regards to finding snakes at altitude, a lot of it does come, you see less and less the higher you get up. So if, we, if this snake talk was in Watamu, the list of dangerous snakes would have been probably nine snakes longer. Um, so that in that regards, you find less and less. With altitude, I don't want to say never, but generally speaking, puff adders you can find at really high altitudes, well above 8,000 feet. I've had, I've known people finding them there. Um, Kenya horn vipers potentially that high, and Egyptian cobras potentially, but there's not a huge amount. A lot of the non-venomous things, brown house snakes, I wouldn't be surprised if you find up there, but not a huge amount else. And yeah. Python, Python. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Are there uh, plants that you can, you know, put in your garden or your chamber or near your house that for sure will be fast snakes? Coming in. So far, I haven't heard of any with any scientific evidence working. Oh, sorry. So the, the question was in regards to planting plants that might deter snakes. But so far, I'm not sure of any that have been scientifically proven to, to keep snakes at bay. There may be some, and there's some in cultural beliefs and folklore. And if it's not poisonous, by all means, plant as many as you want. But you, we just never know that. I can't, I can't say for sure, yes or no. Yeah, I haven't seen any evidence so far that suggests this particular tree. I think if, if someone discovers one, that tree will be incredibly popular in Kenya. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, Holly? Uh, okay. The theory of snakes being more likely to attack adults versus children. Um, I wouldn't say it's true. It all comes to proximity. So if a we're still, all of us, even a small child, in comparison to a snake, generally is quite large. And they feel the need to defend themselves from anything larger than them. So 
if you were to come into the proximity of a snake where it feels like it needs to be defensive, whether you be a toddler or a fully grown human, I think you'll be tre treated the same way. You'll, you'll likely get bitten, yeah. Obviously a larger person is gonna send bigger vibrations through the ground. So it might be slightly more alert to you coming, but when it comes to actually biting someone, I wouldn't be too sure, yeah. Keep usable snake semen with them in years. Okay. Yes, okay. So, um, with snakes being able to store semen and um, fertilize themselves at certain times, certain species have been known to do it and have litters of eggs well past their breeding time, but some are a little bit easier to predict. So, I wouldn't say all of them can. Um, again, I haven't seen enough research to suggest all of them can, but some certainly can. And we've had house snakes and things in captivity, which have had multiple, laid multiple, lay, um, multiple bunches of eggs during different times without being introduced to males. We've had that before. But yeah, I wouldn't say all of them because I'm not, I'm not sure. I haven't seen any evidence that suggests that all of them can do that. Yeah. Like you mentioned, that you're not exporting them at the moment because the waiting for license. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So at the moment, we're not we're not actually producing uh, exporting the venom, but we're still harvesting it um, and storing it. So when our licensing comes through, then we'll be able to continue on with our exportation of venoms. But yeah. So we're still the farm's still working as it would normally milking multiple snakes, but just storing the venom for later use. Yeah. Can you freeze dry? Um, you can, okay, yeah. With freeze drying it, um, we've got a, you, could, you have to refrigerate it or put it on ice the second it's been milked. And then we've got a proper, a little fridge at the farm. Or it's a, like a proper freeze dryer, which dries all the moisture straight out of it. Yeah, yeah. Why do snakes shed their skin? Um, so when the question about snakes shedding their skin is snakes scales and their skin doesn't actually grow with their body. They have to produce a new layer of skin each time and the old layer will be shed off. So it's with snakes shedding, it's due to them growing and snakes will grow throughout their life. So young snakes will be shedding kind of 10, very dependent on species, sometimes 10 or more times a year. Um, and as they get older, they'll slow it down. So by the time you've got a fully grown snake, it should only be shedding a handful of times a year, three to five, sometimes less. Those big vipers, which stay quite dormant, maybe once or twice a year. Yeah. Okay, yeah. another one from Kyle. It says, someone who asked how many vials to treat an Egyptian cobra. Yeah. An analysis was done saying that it needed 180. Oh, yeah. Maybe a little bit more than 18 then. <laughs> okay. Um, so, again, it depends with, with regards to how many vials you need for each kind of snake. Like I said, it does depend on certain, the antivenom as well as, as the certain type of snake. Um, like Kyle has pointed out, or he says the, the information on the Egyptian cobra, certain antivenoms was, what did he say, 100 and, 180 vials of antivenom needed to treat an Egyptian cobra bite. Um, there's a, a lot of politics as to what antivenoms are in the market um, and how effective it all is. So it's trying to find the most viable one um, as to why they're getting put, in, put on and off the market. But um, politics that go on in it. Yeah. The cost of a vial of antivenom. Again, it depends who makes it. Um, the co when it comes to the cost of antivenom, um, it, it depends who makes it and how how much they're producing at a time. Because obviously, if you're producing thousands of vials of antivenom, you can bring your production costs a little bit down. Um, but to give you an idea, roughly. 200 to 250 dollars a vial to produce it. Yeah. At one time it was being sold. Again, certain antivenoms, some will be cheaper, some will be more expensive. 
but antivenoms that were used in the past in Kenya were about three hundred dollars a vial. Yeah. Well, we had a Springer Spaniel in Florida yeah. that was hit by an eastern diamondback rattlesnake. Yeah. And we took it for treatment. They charged $950 yeah. for one dose of antivenom. Yeah. So it's pretty expensive. Antivenom in with when it comes to the state is a lot, I don't know why it tends to be a lot more expensive than it is out here, but it's a lot more accessible. In the states, you're having under 10 snake bite deaths a year. Um, with a similar, and you look at what's the state's population, 300 and something million, where Kenya's what, 40, between 40 and 50 million, um, and we're having a thousand deaths. So it, it just shows with a good effective regional antivenom, the numbers could be a lot lower. Yeah. yeah. Because, well, sorry, where we live, yeah. about maybe an hour and a half down the road, they had a place that bought live eastern diamondbacks for $100 per foot, is what they paid for them to bring them into milk. Jesus. So the demand in Florida was quite quite a demand, and they would give you a hundred dollars per foot for a live eastern diamond bag. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case here. Otherwise, I'd be out a lot more. <laughs> um, generally speaking, a three-year shelf life, but it has to be refrigerated. So antivenom's shelf life is three years when it's refrigerated. Yeah. What would be the normal range of course? Um, and are they territorial? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, when it comes to snakes being territorial and how big their range is, so snakes aren't territorial in the way that they'll chase other snakes out of their territory, but they do have a home range and um, they'll bounce from a certain spot in their range to another where they know. So if they know there's a cavity in this tree, I'll go there. There's a termite mound I can hide there and they'll bounce between it. So that's why sometimes you'll see a snake in one spot for like a month, and then it disappears. And then three months later, it's back. It's because it's done a, a circuit of its home range, but it's not necessarily territorial. And then when it comes to size, it's very size, it's species dependent. So mambas can have quite a large, I think it was, I read somewhere, I think it was five kilometers squared. But um, in Kenya, we haven't done quite enough research. We need to start chipping them to actually understand how big their home range is. I know South Africa is doing a little bit more now, but we haven't done any of that just yet. So it could be different here to there as well. Yeah. I remember when we talked about a snake one time around, you said, I think it was, I think it was you, um, that it's, you know, having that snake around, he'll know your territory, he'll yeah. know your noises, he'll hear your dogs. And if you go and kill it or, or move it far away, then another snake, snake may come into that area who won't be familiar with all of that. And that's when you find a snake in the house. Is that yeah. kind of true? So yeah, when it comes to having snakes in a territory, as long as it's, if a snake's within your, its territory or its home range is within your garden or whatever it is, as long as it's not causing a problem and you know where it is, it's quite good to have. But I wouldn't say just because you killed it, another one will come in. It's not a guarantee that one will come into that area because there could be more coexisting with that one there. Certain species, not so much. So like spitting cobras and Egyptian cobras will actually eat smaller cobras. So if you have a big one, it's not always the, the worst snake to have around as long as it's not coming too close to your house because pets and big snakes and people just don't coexist very well. Yeah. Yeah, Holly. We have a question on baby boomstangs. Yeah. Um, to ask, but they're very colourful and it makes them look like birds. Is this part of their survival or feeding strategy? Well, so with baby boomstangs and their colour, the one that in the photo which was displaying, um, that's more to show itself in a threat display, make itself stand out and seem a little bit scary. Generally speaking, snakes tend not to be bright colors um, because of birds of prey will pick them out too easily. So without, when it deflates its throat, it's more brown the whole way through. And the top of the head is very green, so it matches leaves. So it's not, it's not using it for attracting birds and other animals. Yeah, no worries. It's all very well having these snakes in the snake park and milking them, yeah. but do you allow them to breed? And if so, how many babies are born as an example each year and what do you do with these babies? Okay, so with the snake farm in terms of breeding, um, yes, we do allow them to breed, 
and a huge majority of the ones that are bred will be released back into the wild, but we do hold handfuls of them back. Um, some of the reasoning for this, if you have a snake in captivity from a hatchling all the way to adult, you they they can become tolerant of you. I wouldn't say tame, but tolerant of you over time, and they get used to being picked up and handled. So when you are milking them later on down the line, it's not as much of a hazard for you because you don't need to worry about this black mamba or whatever it is lunging at you every five minutes. It's been milked throughout its life and it knows what's coming. Um, so yes, we do breed snakes at the farm um, and release a lot of the babies. Kyle might know exactly numbers wise how many we release annually. I'm not sure off the top of my head, um, but snakes are very complicated to breed as well. There are some species which takes a lot of time and effort. So we do, we do try and do a little bit of that, a little bit of the more technical breeding. Some you just throw in the cage and magic happens. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so the question is about the illegal pet trade out of Kenya, and it does happen a fair amount. So a lot of our species, which tie into Uganda and Tanzania, um, like black members, green members, puff adders, they don't get exported as much because you can get them there. The problem is Kenya, it's illegal to export wildlife out of Kenya. So snakes fall under that category. But we have a couple of endemic species like I've shown, which was the Kenya horn viper. And then this little guy here, a Mount Kenya bush viper. So these snakes are endemic to Kenya and they do get smuggled out for the legal pet trade. What tends to happen is they get smuggled into Tanzania or Uganda and then get exported legally as listed under as different species. So the Mount Kenya bush viper would be listed as a juvenile green bush viper, and it makes its way into Europe or North America. The big market's actually Europe at the moment, and Kenya horn vipers is the same. Um, when it comes to regulating it, every now and again, someone gets caught, um, but it's hard to know numbers because they're not being exported out of Kenya. So it's hard to know exactly how many are going in and out of the places. Most of it gets done through Uganda and they generally don't get caught when it's going out. So it just arrives in Europe as a green bush viper listed when it's clearly not. So this question is like, you know, if they were to study the masters or onwards, where would they go to collect the data? That's a very good question, where to collect the data. Um, this is a very good question. I'll have to, I'm not actually sure. Um, I don't know who, I don't know if anyone's doing some big research on it in Kenya. I'm sure we'll have numbers within KWS as well. Yeah, that would be a good idea, yeah. If you, one good idea from Holly, maybe send the East, uh, go on the Facebook group, East African snakes and other reptiles um, and ask it there. Otherwise, Kyle might know, but I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, if you pose it on the Facebook group, I think it's actually called East African Reptiles and Amphibians now. Someone will know there, Steve Spools or Florian Finnick. Someone, someone will know. Yeah. Yeah, that I'm not too sure of. I'm sure there will be antivenom. I can't say. Oh, yeah. I'm sure there will be antivenom in Uganda. Um, I can't say what it is, if it's effective, because I'm not actually sure. Um, but I'm sure there will be antivenom in some of the hospitals. Whether whether it's good, effective antivenom, I can't, I can't say. I'm not sure. Yeah. Great. I think that's it. Good Q&A session.